In this lesson, we're focusing on DNA sequencing, and we need to be able to recognize the applications of DNA sequencing to map species genomes. So as scientists develop more and more tools to work with large quantities of DNA, they're able to learn more about it than they ever could before. And this led to a situation where they had all this data and they had to learn how to store it and manage it and organize it and work with it, right? So from this, bioinformatics was born, which is the science of collecting and analyzing complex biological data, such as genetic codes. So DNA sequencing is the process of determining the exact nucleotide sequence of a piece of DNA. And the sequences can tell us where genes are, if they're different from someone else's, what normal variation is, what pathological variation is. Um, even single nucleotide variations can lead to huge changes, which we know from looking at mutations. So sequencing is used substantially in medicine and epidemiology. For example, for example, tracking strains of viruses, uh, but also in agricultural fields of study and innovation, uh, as well as cladistics and phylogenetics. So in order to sequence really large amounts of biological data, the genome first has to be broken down into smaller fragments using restriction enzymes, right? We've seen these before. Samples are then amplified using PCR. They're denatured to separate the strands, then primers in the DNA polymerase are added. In order to build the new DNA strands for the template, uh, so yeah, in order to build new DNA strands for the template strands, nucleotides are added to the mix. Makes sense. But then the sample is actually split in four. Into one of these samples, say one, goes modified cytosine nucleotides, right? And each one will have modified, um, you know, guanine and all those kinds of things. And what they do is they have fl a fluorescent marker attached to them, and they're missing a hydroxyl group. OK, they're missing the hydroxyl, hydroxyl group and that stops them from being able to form a backbone and build the whole DNA backbone. So if the newly built DNA strand randomly chooses one of these modified cytosines to attach, say we're in this test tube here, what happens is the chain of DNA actually stops producing. Now, each one of the four sections of the original DNA sequence will get one specific modified nucleotide, right? So all of these four have a different modified nucleotide. So in each of the sample, a different nucleotide type will be the one that causes the DNA to terminate building. Now, once these samples are loaded into a gel, they run side by side through, you know, gel electrophoresis, and the different size fragments are read via their fluorescent marker in order to read from smallest to largest. So they run on a gel that can differentiate between fragments that are as small as even one base. So if the smallest sequence here shows up as G, right, it's a guanine, then the first terminated sequence actually begins with a C. Makes sense. The next sequence ends with an A, right? the second one here, meaning the sequence continued from the C with a complementary T and so on. So that's how they actually sequence things. The method of sequencing that I just showed you, it's called chain termination sequencing, or the Sanger method after the scientist who created it. But progress means that we're now using next generation sequencing, which take advantage of so many other tools and technology that have cropped up since. And next gen sequencing allows for the entire genome to be sequenced simultaneously, and it speeds up the process significantly. We're also now pushing into third generation of sequencing methods um, as technology progresses. Now, sequencing can be used in medicine for diagnostics, uh, for tracing traits through families, um, you know, tailoring, tailoring treatments that work for specific um, sequences in cancer cell lines. It's used in metagenomics, which looks at environments and determines, say, the microbial genomes and diversity from places ranging from soils to, say, your gut bacteria. Now, DNA sequencing can be used to also determine the genetic risk of a disease appearing in a family. For example, uh, BRCA1, it's the breast cancer type 1 susceptibility protein. It's coded for by a gene known as BRCA1, and it's expressed in breast and other tissue, and it repairs DNA, right? It repairs damaged DNA. So if there are heaps of mutations or damage to this gene, the protein can't correct the DNA damage, and it leads to more mutations accruing in the cell line, and then it can turn them cancerous. So because of this, it can be used as a marker for predisposition to cancer in different families. So you can follow this trait or this mutated gene down through a family. Now, DNA sequencing opened the door to DNA profiling, which identifies unique natural variations within a, an individual's genome. It relies on short tandem repeats, which are sections of non-coding DNA, which have a lot of repeats like AG, 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 over and over and over. Now, each individual has a unique 
combination of two alleles and a unique number of repeats. So this acts as a kind of form of identification. Okay, It can be visualized using gel electrophoresis and it can be compared to, say, a reference profile. DNA profiling can be applied in forensics quite a lot, right, through comparison of crime scene evidence uh, to genomes of suspects and victims and other people present at the scene. It can be used to clarify familial, familial identifications, uh, family isolation, genealogy, missing persons, identify, unidentified people in natural disasters, which isn't something we usually think about. Uh, it's used to better clarify organism identification and classification and phylogeny to determine, say, the degrees of valuable, uh, sorry, the pedigrees of valuable animals like racehorses and purebred dogs. I can also interestingly and grossly trace meat to an animal source. So uh, very recently there was a scandal in the UK around horse meat being found and being sold as beef. So we live in an era where you can get your entire genome sequence for about 300 bucks using a test kit that got sent to you in the mail. But you've got to appreciate that this has come a really long way in a very short amount of time. Given that we have 3 billion base pairs in our genome, sequencing the entire thing has been a bit of a mission. In, in the late 80s and early 90s, many scientists came together to collaborate to accurately sequence the complete human genome. And the Human Genome Project ran for over a decade. It cost around $3 billion and used scientists in around 200 universities from around the world. The project had many stages and phases, and it tested comparatively a small sample of people to sequence all of our chromosomes, right? They studied mother and father and offspring trios to analyze gene changes, and also, you know, sort of slowly sampled more and more people from around the world. Their representation of their sample, you know, probably needs to be increased to get a more accurate view of the variation between genes uh, across our species. But what it did show is that variation in our species is far greater than previously imagined, and it's still increasing. Now, they didn't officially finish the entire genome, mostly just the parts of the chromosome uh, that are not repeats. So they didn't really look too much at the telomeres or the centromeres. Basically, their work laid foundations, you know, serious foundations for every element of genetics and bioinformatics not yet explored. And all of the Human Genome Project's work was published and made freely available to the public, you know, and scientists through databases which continue to be updated. And their work has interestingly also opened up discussions about privacy of biometric data, informed consent, and accuracy in genetic testing. Now, in uh, 2013, the Supreme Court of the US ruled that naturally occurring human genes are not an invention and therefore cannot be pat patented, I guess you should say. Um, and that would allow certain companies who have purchased the right to research and work with them to stop other companies using them as well. But private companies can actually apply for patents on edited or synthetic genes, which have been altered significantly from their natural version to count as a new patentable product. So, you know, when we're talking ethics, this is the kind of interesting stuff we need to think about as well. So again, our main purpose here is to recognize different applications of DNA sequencing to map a species genome.